Hi, it's been a little while since we've done a public uh, video and everybody is wondering what is going on with gold and silver and what I want to do is sort of cover the big picture. Uh, a lot of people lose sight of the big picture and it's keeping that big picture in mind that allows me to sleep at night through these pullbacks and makes me feel very, very comfortable with my position. And I'd like you to be as comfortable too, you know, if I, so it, I hope this helps. Uh, this information was, I had a webinar that I did with Dave Morgan of silver-investor.com for his mastermind group a couple of weeks ago. And the last 20% of the presentation contained these slides and for a lot of people it was sort of a revelation. So I wanted to bring this to everybody and, and show them what's going on. Uh, so again, we've seen this before. This is the Federal Reserve creating base currency. So this is the paper dollars that exist. And what you see is there's QE1 and 2, and here we are in QE3, which is open-ended. They, you know, it's just $85 billion every month. And so this chart is over a month old, so that we're up here somewhere now. But here's the thing. This is, uh, the Y2K bugs that, that Alan Greenspan thought was going to take all of the banking system down, and that's his response to that emergency. That little blip is 9-11. So that is the response to the um, emergency on the scale of 9-11. This is the response to the crisis of 08, and what it's saying is that there's a huge emergency out there that they are still responding to that the crisis of 08 has never gone away. Everybody's feeling good now because the stock market is up. Sure, it only took $2.2 trillion to get it there. <laughs> so <clears throat> where is all, why aren't we seeing massive inflation if they've created all of this currency? Well, because this has been created by the Federal Reserve who is owned by the world's largest banks and it's, it's been a gift to their owners. Uh, this is the excess reserves held at the Fed by the big banks. So excess reserves are reserves in excess of what is required by law uh, at whatever the fractional reserve ratio is uh, for fractional reserve lending. So the banks have to have a certain amount of base currency to be able to create loans off of. Uh, and so normally they keep right at the minimum, which is zero reserves or just a little bit above it. Again, this is 9-11. And here we are, all of this currency gets created and then leaks out, created and leaks out, created and leaks out into circulation and created. So there's almost uh, about $1.7 trillion of the currency that has been created, the 2.2 trillion or 2.3, uh, that is just sitting on banks' balance sheets. But they get to use this as leverage in the stock market. They get to use it for uh, margin requirements. And so this increases the gambling in the stock market and helps propel the stock market up. So the stock market's up, but it only took $2.2 trillion to get it there. Um, this is gold in today's dollars, and this is inflation adjusted using the pre-Ronald Reagan CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So the basket of goods and services that we used to track uh, to calculate inflation up until the Ronald Reagan era, and then it started to change, and every president since Ronald Reagan, every administration has meddled with it more and more and more to where it doesn't really resemble reality today. Instead of the CPI, I call it the CP lie. Uh, but Shadow Stats, uh, John Williams of Shadow Government Statistics, uh, shadowstats.com, um, recalculates consumer price inflation based on the pre-Ronald Reagan CPI basket of goods and services. Uh, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle between that original CPI and the one that they use today where they keep on changing it every year. Uh, but what you see here is that that 1980 high was equivalent to 9950 bucks, basically, in today's dollars according to the pre-Ronald Reagan CPI. Uh, according to the CP lie, it's 2500 bucks. Is, so gold, would, to be, for it to be in a bubble, if all of the fundamentals were the same as back in 1980, 
gold would have to be somewhere between $2,500 and $10,000 for it to be in a bubble. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. However, the fundamentals are very different from the 1980s to today. So I believe that you are going to see gold exceed that high. Uh, this is the Dow Gold Ratio, and it's the way you're used to seeing it. Most analysts will show the points on the Dow divided by the price of gold each day, and, and you just plot a, a dot on this line of the graph, and what you see is there's an equilibrium where everything is in balance, where stocks and gold are fairly valued, and that occurred somewhere between three and five ounces, so about four ounces of gold is, is the equilibrium. In 29, it took 18 ounces of gold to buy one share of the Dow, in other words, gold's value was 1 18th, of the, of the Dow's, gold's price was 1 18th of the Dow's points. Uh, then it fell down to just two in 1932. A bigger bubble in 1966 at 28 ounces of gold to buy the Dow, or one, gold's price 1 28th of the points of the Dow. And then it fell to where the gold became free trading in 1971, and the will of the public and the free market drove its value up until there was a day in 1980 where gold and the Dow were the same, the points on the Dow and the price of gold. So only one ounce of gold bought a share of the Dow. Then we go into the year 1999-2000. There is no time in all of human history that gold was as unloved and ignored as this time frame. Uh, back in uh, the years, um, in the late 1800s, uh, we, went, uh, we were on the classical gold standard. But by 1971, we had abandoned gold standard completely, and gold became free trading. And it went into a bubble in 1980, but from 1980 to 2000, investors had given up on it. In 1971, the world, when the dollar was unpegged from gold, the world's currencies became fiat currencies. This is the first time in human history where gold and silver were no nation's money. Uh, it's the first time where nobody wanted it. Investors had given up on it. Governments had given up on it. Nobody wanted to hear about gold. And so gold's value was 145th the value of the points on the Dow, which means that it did not purchase enough paper assets. Paper assets during the NASDAQ bubble were more overvalued than at any time in history. Gold more undervalued, and it's reverting today. Now, <clears throat> this is a linear graph. Uh, it goes from uh, 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 to 25, and it's showing the amount of change, not the rate of change. Uh, if you go from 5 to 10, that's a 100% increase. If you go from 10 to 15, though, that's only a 50% increase, and if you go from 15 to 20, that's only a 30% increase. So it isn't showing you really what's, how, how much is left of this bull market. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is show you a logarithmic graph. Now we go from 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100 ounces of gold required uh, by one share of the Dow. In other words, uh, 10 times 10 times 10. Each step is a factor of 10 times the last step. And what you see here, it, you see that these peaks overvalued and it reverts, tries to revert back to the mean but overshoots. More overvalued, it tries to revert back to the mean and overshoots a whole lot more. More, the, this is the most overvalued for stocks and undervalued for gold in history. It's trying to revert back to the mean, but we have to work off all that energy. And so I'm expecting a day where uh, gold's price is double the points on the Dow, meaning half an ounce of gold will buy the Dow. Now, I'm going to invert this because for most people, seeing a line going down, that's usually bad when, when a graph is going down. However. The way this chart is presented, when gold is rising, and when gold is outperforming stocks, this line falls. So I'm going to ver invert it and give you the gold-Dow ratio instead of the Dow-Gold ratio. And so gold is rising currently. We're just in this little pullback, but it still does not buy, you know, here th the mean is up here. And we have to overshoot that mean to work off the energy just like we did the other times that gold was too undervalued and paper assets were too overvalued. And so we're going to be seeing something way up there. This is just logic. And I believe that it will happen. 
technical analysts can, can proclaim the bull market in gold dead, uh, that it's all over with. You may as well pack your bags and go home. It's not over with until this says it over, it's over with. The press can say whatever they want. It's not over with until this is over with. This is, oops, this is um, back to um, a linear graph again where it's, it's showing you the amount of change instead of the rate of change. And what you see here is that gold is just silly, stupid, incredibly undervalued. It will reassert itself. It has to rise at least back up to fair value. But with all this uh, suppression of the price, it's just like a spring or pushing a ball, a, a ball underwater. When you lose control, the further you push a spring down, the higher it's going to bounce. And so I just think you're going to see some spectacular things from gold and silver. Now, this is the golden bull, the bull market in gold. And what I've done here is created a chart that just goes from January of 1999 to the end of 2001, because I want to point something out. Most people, most technical analysts, do all of their charting and trend lines and channels starting in 2001 with this low. And when you look at like a 20-year chart of gold, uh, you'll see a double bottom in gold. But it's actually two double bottoms. There's a double bottom at 252 here. And then this is, is not uh, actually a double bottom with that. This is 256 or 257 right here. That's $252. The bull market starts where the lowest price, where the bear market is finished. When the lowest price point is hit, that's where the bull market starts technically. So that high that comes right after the lowest that gold has been uh, at the end of its bear market from 1980 to 1999, that is the first high to measure from when you're measuring a bull market. The reason that that's important is because there has been a new trend line that has been established. Uh, so this chart starts back in 1998. And here's gold rising. And I've put a couple of other things in here uh, that there was an area where it broke. When I first got involved in gold, uh, everybody was looking at this perfect trend line, and it broke the trend line. Everybody started to panic. Everybody was pro proclaiming with gold at about 400 and something dollars an ounce that the gold bull market was over with just because it broke that trend line. And then also, Gold rises and then consolidates. It rises and consolidates. It rises and consolidates. It rises and consolidates. And after this thing, I was writing an article that I never finished called The Great Fake Out Shake Out. I didn't finish it because uh, by the time I was done writing the article, gold had already risen back above that trend line. But then it did this, you know? And uh, what's happened here is these consolidations have become much more volatile ever since that fake out, shake out. It, it rises more and it consolidates longer, rises more and consolidates longer. Well, this is the biggest consolidation and the pullback is almost as big as what we had here back in uh, 2008. Uh, and one of the reasons for showing you these consolidations is your greatest gains come right after a consolidation ends. You go from the low point in a consolidation and these are our enormous moves. Here we're from under $700 to $1,900 in three years running with gold just charging up like a rocket. Well, it has to work off some of that energy. And I think we might be done. Uh, and I think that there's uh, some, a spectacular move coming sometime. It may not happen this year. If it doesn't, it'll happen next year. But because this is actually the low and not this, you have to use that first high as a trend channel line. If you, so you go from that high to this high. If you duplicate that line and move it down here, what you see is three intercepts. And this graph was presented in Australia uh, about a month ago. Since then, this has come back down. And today, it's sitting right on that line again. Uh, and then. This, I'm going to talk about silver for a second. This is the gold-silver ratio inverted so that when silver is rising, this goes up. So 
This is when silver's value is 1 20th of gold's, 1 40th, 1 60th, 1 80th, and 1 100th of gold's price. And uh, what you see here is that we go along at, at 12 or 15 to 1, that range. And the reason for that is that uh, for, for the first 2,000 years that gold and silver were money, the average exchange rate was somewhere between 12 and 15 to 1. It varied different places on the planet, but the average around the planet was about 12 or 15 to 1. And the reason is that's about how much more silver there is that's mineable than gold in the Earth's crust. But then along comes the uh, Comstock load and the Silver Valley in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, some of the biggest silver strikes on Earth. And then we began the classical gold standard and countries around the world demonetized silver and relegated it to just change. And so treasuries started dehoarding it and silver's value plummeted to where, uh, you know, in, in the Great Depression, it was one one hundredth of gold's value here. And so it's been out of whack now for more than a century, but one of the things that happened is with World War II, electronics came of age, and we used up all this above ground silver. Now, silver is only cheap because people think it should be cheap. It's, a by, it's, it's also a byproduct of base metal mining. This natural ratio of 12 to 1 was when, uh, when you mined silver and you mined gold from gold and silver mines. Uh, when we had the real estate booms and so on, as, as electronics and every, as um, everything in modern society came of age, the industrial society, we started producing a lot of copper for copper wiring and copper plumbing. And what that does is produce excess silver and it kept this suppressed. And during this time though, we used up all the above, above ground supplies, all these stockpiles that were left over from governments dishoarding uh, uh, silver, and so that's gone. Uh, above ground stocks are at, we're just coming off extreme lows from back in, I think, 2007, 2008. Uh, the above ground stockpiles of silver measured in uh, average uh, months of, of how much silver is above ground compared to how the rate that you're using it, how many months of silver are left and normally there was always at least five to ten years of silver above ground if you stopped mining at any given moment what was above ground in stockpiles would last ten years well we got down to a point where it was just about three months of silver left above ground if you had stopped mining industry would have consumed it in just three months and uh, we're coming up, up off of that low which is one of the most bullish things that there is once stockpiles start rising it means that investors are bidding uh, silver away from industry and paying the uh, commodities exchanges to store it. And so the stockpiles start rising. The last time this happened, silver went in the 80s, went, or the 70s, went from $4 to 50 bucks. So this is a very bullish thing that stockpiles are now starting to grow. But I believe that you're going to see silver up here, and right now silver is uh, 1 60th or less of gold's price. Uh, so here is silver in today's dollars measured uh, with the shadow stats CPI again, the pre-Reagan CPI, and it would be almost 600 bucks an ounce. Uh, with, with the CP lie that the government uses today, it would still be $150 an ounce for that 1980 high. And Silver is selling below its 1980 price. There isn't anything else that you can name except maybe computer chips that are selling at a discount to their 1980 price. Silver is still just stupidly low and it's going to rise. And here it is measured against paper assets again. We haven't even come anywhere near this equilibrium. And because it's been, it got so low here, we have to work off that energy. You're probably going to see a super spike in silver that's going to just take everybody's breath away. You'll probably see silver at one-tenth of gold's price instead of one-sixtieth. That means you would get six times leverage over gold buying silver. And uh, then I wanted to show you a couple things. Here's some, this is technical analysis. I do a little bit of technical analysis. I don't like it because uh, it's, it's it's only right about 55 or 60% of the time, but that means it's wrong 
40, 45% of the time, and I seem to fall in that 40, 45% an awful lot. <laughs> but um, so this is Wednesday, Thursday, and last Friday, and then when the markets opened uh, in Australia and Hong Kong, there was a flash crash in silver, and it went down into the 20s, and it rose again. And so this is the last uh, couple of months in silver, and this is where it fell from uh, 28 bucks down to uh, 22.50. And uh, it's been noodling sideways. It did this flash crash, and the reason that this flash crash is good news is because there was a gap to fill here. Back in 2010, silver just charged ahead and it, it blew through uh, this area, its previous resistance of $21 without stopping, and it didn't make any type of trading range or anything. So between $21 and, uh, and this $22 area, there was still a gap that it needed to fill. It needed to go back down and visit this support area at a minimum, and it did that. So the low for silver might be in. I'm not sure. Uh, the real strong support is in this area right down here. But you know what? We don't have that far to go. Uh, so I think that it, it's, it's very possible that the low is in. We could be seeing 20 or, uh, or $19 silver. But, you know, I have a feeling that we could also see $50 silver <laughs> just as quickly. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this pullback may last a little longer. Uh, it, it, we, we might not uh, break into new highs this year, but we might by the end, before the end of the year. Uh, you know, I don't have a perfect crystal ball, but when you measure the fundamentals, Silver and gold have to rise to cover a certain percentage of the currency supply. They have to rise to cover, you know, to make up for inflation. They have to rise to get back in balance with all the other asset classes that there are, real estate and stocks. And people always chase yesterday's news. And so uh, with all of the liquidity that has been created by Ben Bernanke creating all this base currency, it's, it's going in to the previous asset classes that people were chasing because those are the familiar asset classes. Gold and silver are still under-owned. There, there, very few people own gold and silver. There will come a day when it becomes a, a fairly large asset class, but that doesn't happen by more ounces just appearing out of thin air. What happens is the price goes a lot higher per ounce. And so, that's where we're destined to go. This thing isn't over with until the fundamentals say it's over with, not a technical analyst. Now, I've been living in Southern California since I was four years old, and I have never been to Yosemite. So I'm going to change into some jeans right now, and I'm driving up to Yosemite. So thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you later. And by the way, we just finished up the second episode of Hidden Secrets of Money. And so if you have not already done so, please visit our website, hiddensecretsofmoney.com, and sign up for the email notification when the new episode is being released. Thanks.